This message was delivered at Westminster Presbyterian on November 26, 2023. The message was prepared by the Rev. Miller Ansel of Trinity Presbyterian in Waco, Texas and read by Mr. Terry Miller. It is based upon Genesis chapter 15 verses 1 through 21 and it is titled God's Covenant with Abraham. After these things the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham and Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward the heaven and number the stars if you were able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur, brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans, to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for four hundred years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out of with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, Behold, a smoking firepot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. That sends a word of God, please be seated. Let us pray. Oh, Father, we pray that you will guide us and direct us as we look at your word, Holy Spirit. Speak through your servant. Speak the words that you want to have heard, Father, and block those words that are not truthful and are not helpful to the congregation. Father, receive our worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, I'll be reading this sermon from Reverend Ansel, which was recorded last year sometime as he was going through his Genesis series. And we've enjoyed his sermon so far through Genesis. So this is Genesis 15. Covenant theology is vitally important for us to understand how the Bible fits together. Covenant theology is important for us to see how the Bible fits together. It's the backbone of the Bible. It shows us how our relationship with God is and looks like and what our Redeemer has done for us. Dare I say, if one wants a deeper, fuller relationship with the Lord, then one must understand the covenants of Scripture. He gives us the fullest picture of the glorious gospel and our beautiful Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, as we've gone through Genesis, we have seen the covenant of works with Adam. All he had to do was not eat of the free of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and he would have been confirmed in that covenant of work. But we know that he eats of the forbidden tree and plunges himself and us and all humanity deep into sin, and we call that original sin. 
the consequences of that. But immediately our God enters into a covenant of grace in which he promises to send Jesus Christ to rid all, all those who are found in him of sin and death through his life, through the cross, and through his resurrection. The outworking of the covenant of grace includes many other covenants, various administrations of the one covenant of grace. We might think of the covenant of grace as a big umbrella covering many administration of God's covenants in the Old Testament. We've seen one already. We looked at the Noahic covenant in weeks before, and there will be others to come, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the new covenant. But this evening we come to the gracious Abrahamic covenant, really the formal inauguration of it, in fact, the ratification of it, with the promises already made to Abraham. This is not another new covenant, but a renewal of the covenant. We especially find the promises for land and for offspring put more formally in covenantal form in this passage. So this evening we will do as we've done in the past, which is to look at the covenant of grace concerning the element of a covenant. Those elements are the preamble, the historical prologue, the stipulations, the sanctions, and the oaths that are taken. Finally, we will see how this gracious covenant points and is fulfilled, points to and is fulfilled by Jesus Christ, our surety. First, let's look at the preamble, verse one. Now, not all of these elements are lumped together by Moses in this chapter, but they are all present in some form. And we begin with the preamble, verse one. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Abraham was given a vision by God. So quite clearly, this is a covenant between two parties, the Lord and Abraham. Interestingly, it happens as a vision. This revelation is given to Abram in a vision. That is to say, the whole chapter of Genesis 15 describes the vision given to Abram. We find it setting, it is at nighttime. We see that in verse five, and we see in verse 12 that the sun is setting. So we see that it is during the evening. We might say that this vision like a dream, the world doesn't quite, I'm sorry. We might say that in this vision like a dream, the world doesn't quite uh, appear the way it always does. And yet this is more than a dream. This vision is a state where God causes Abraham to see various things, primarily the working out of a covenant. And God gives that to Abraham in this object form, this object lesson. This is very rare. We speak of visions today in a different way, vision statements, casting a vision. Someone said, I had a vision from God and so on. But this vision is very specific. It's new revelation that is coming to us. In fact, a vision is one of the forms that God communicates his revelation to man. Well, this word is only used in two other places. This word for vision, it's used when Balaam speaks to the people of God and in Ezekiel 13, where the prophets are condemned for their false visions. So let us not seek our own private vision like Abraham, but rather embrace Abraham vision of God as revelation and God's covenant made with him and how it applies to us. It does concern us, even though this, in this preamble, the parties are only Abraham and the Lord. Well, the historical background is given in verses two through five and seven through eight. Next is the historical prologue. This would be the history between the two parties leading to this covenant ratification. In verse 1, God commands Abraham not to fear. What is he not to fear? Now, we might be drawn to think that Chetah Lamar of Elam, that we spoke of last week, might be coming back to take revenge on 
Abraham is routing him. But the context suggests something quite different, which is that Abraham is not to fear dying childless. Abraham is not to fear dying childless. And so this historical prologue shows Abraham recalling God's promise to him to give him an heir, in fact, to make a whole nation out of Abraham's family. But Abraham is afraid that God's promise is impossibly impossible. It is, as Abram and Sarah look at the promise humanly, impossible. For Sarah was barren, Abraham was well up in age. And how were they to believe this promise? They had to take it as the bare truth from God that God would fulfill his promise and give them a child. Well, Abraham thought that Eliezer of Damascus would inherit all that was Abraham's. Eliezer might be a great guy, but he's not one of Abraham's children. And God will have it his way. God has promised him his own seed from his own loins. So what are we to make here in this historical prologue of Abraham's complaining? Is he complaining to God? Is he questioning God? It is impossible to know Abraham's tone and actually what his motives were exactly. And as one who has misread tones in text, emails, and social media, it is wise to think the best of others when they communicate with us. And this includes Abraham here. And even at best, his tone is one of great concern and fearful distress. He's uneasy in his situation as God communicates to him. And what are we to do in similar situations? We have similar situations in our lives, just as Abraham has. Well, we ought never to complain against God, firstly. But we can go to him and unburden ourselves. We can ask him what he is doing in our lives and why he's bringing us these things. But we can't doubt him and we can't challenge his decrees. Perhaps you are a greatly burdened person this evening. Maybe you're unsure what God is doing in your life. Don't be angry with God. God is working all things for your good and for the good of his church. But go to him in prayer. Plead your case to him. He is Abba Father, and he is your compassionate friend in your time of distress. Like Abram, we will not find comfort, trust. I'm sorry. Like Abram, we will find comfort, trust, and greater faith as we go to God in prayer. Now, we may not find all the answers. God doesn't owe us all the answers to what he is doing in our lives. But our Father will certainly ease our pain. Abraham is comforted by an answer that Abraham will, that Eliezer will not be the heir, but that Abraham would have a son. And not only that, his descendants would be like the stars in the sky. Who can count the stars in the sky? Children, can you count the stars? in the sky and come up with a number? No, we can't do that. Many of you have been enjoying messages of James Webb's space telescope this last week, and surely no one has attempted to count all the stars in those pictures. Well, this is dated a year. In those pictures, because it would be impossible. The children of Abraham will be too numerous to count, is what God is trying to say to Abram. But this is not the only promise God is reaffirming in his covenant. He also reaffirms the promise of a land in Canaan in verses 7 through 8. And the events that have led up to this formal covenant giving. God says, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land that is the land of Canaan to inherit it. God reminds Abram of his calling, which is very similar to the refrain we find with Israel as they were in slavery in Egypt. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. God reminds his people that he can be trusted and that he will fulfill all of his covenantal promises. After all, he is the God who took you out of sinful, wicked land and brought you into the promised land, the land of Abraham's inheritance. Thus, in this historic prologue, the point is made that God has been faithful thus far, and there is every reason to believe 
he will be in the future, for God is the same yesterday, to me, today, and forever. In fact, as we get to the sanctions of this covenant, uh, we will be able to ante as why he can be trusted. Well, let's look at the stipulations of this covenant, stipulation or conditions. These are the conditions that Abraham is to meet in order to gain the promises of offspring and land. Abraham must meet these stipulations. He has a covenant obligation to meet these stipulations. The first one is in verse 1, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. So negatively, Adam is told not to fear. Positively, we can say that God was calling Abraham to faith and confidence to assurance that what was promised would come to fruition, as we read in Hebrews 11. Why is there need to fear? God is fully trustworthy. The second stipulation we find is in 12 through 16. Now, this is kind of hard to categorize. Perhaps we could have said that this is the future historical prologue. But I've opted to say that this future enslavement of Israel by Egypt for 400 years is the stipulation to meet before receiving the promised land. This slavery in Egypt for 400 years could be seen as a stipulation prior to the receiving of the land of Canaan. Yet at the same time, it is simply a prophecy so that Israel would not lose hope in their enslavement. As we talked about this morning, God does that with us, doesn't he? He gives us a living hope of the future blessings and bliss of heaven and the new heavens and the new earth so that we will grow weary and well-doing and lose heart. And so we go to verse 12, and here in the vision, Abram is put into a deep sleep, a prophetic sleep, maybe even you could call it a trance. And like him, let's play within a play. We have here a prof prophetic vision within a vision. The prophecy contains Israel and Egypt, but also God's patience and deliverance as well in judgment. He is patient even in the affliction of the Hebrews before bringing judgment on Pharaoh and his army. We also see this with the Amorites, who were a powerful tribe of the Canaanites. Why are they still so wicked and unjudged? Because God is waiting for their sins to reach the brim before the cup of judgment. Remember, he said, the sins of the Amorites are not fully addressed as of yet. Now, why is that so important to us, you ask? Because we see wickedness flourishing all around us, don't we? We see evil going unchecked. We see injustice and oppression. Or maybe it's even more personal than that. You've experienced the hatred of others, perhaps friends or acquaintances. You've experienced abuse and wrongdoing from those around you. And you ask the question, how long? How long? We see the psalmist asking that in Psalm 13. How long? What is God doing? Psalm 13 should be your meditation. When you have that questioning of God, let's read it here together. Psalm 13 to the choir master, a psalm of David. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God, enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death lest my enemy say I have prevailed against him, lest those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. The Christian has his hope in his struggles and in his suffering, as David points this out in Psalm 13. Surely this is a song that Abram could have sung during his time, and it's a song for us to sing and contemplate and meditate upon in our struggles in this world. So the second stipulation is that Abram's offspring will go through a great difficulty, but they will make it out and they will inherit the promised land eventually. 
but they had a long way to go through the wilderness journey, didn't they? And you, brothers and sisters, will make it to your spiritual heavenly promised land in heaven where there is no suffering, no fighting, and no depression. The third stipulation of the covenant in this chapter is one of the most important ones in verse 6. As we've seen, God is giving Abraham every reason to believe him and trust him. And so we read, And Abraham believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him as righteousness. Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord counted it as righteousness. Do you have that belief, that trust in the Lord that is counted for you, for your righteousness? Is that credited to you on your account? Now, at a cursory, re cursory reading of Genesis 15, we might think, well, that's great for Abraham. He believed God about the child and the land, and then we move on. But there's more of that here. More than that here, God is dealing with Abraham's faith. He's dealing with his spiritual future, his spiritual condition. In fact, Abraham knew that it was more than just kids, a heritage, and a promised land. Those are just types of the inheritance that Abram would receive in verse 11 of Hebrews. I'm sorry, in verses 9 and 10 of Hebrews 11, we read, By faith he, that is, Abram, dwelt in the land of promise as a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has no which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. What is that city that Abraham saw and was waiting for by faith? What is that city? Well, as we read in Revelation, it's that city that comes down out of heaven. It is that city of God, the new heavens and the new earth. He knew the land was just a picture and a type of heaven. And... Galatians 3, 7 says, Therefore know that only those who are of faith are true sons of Abraham and receive that inheritance. It is those who believe, those who trust in Christ, who will have that heavenly inheritance that Abram looked forward to. It was not just the land. It was not just the large family and eventually large nation that would come from his seed. But Abraham knew that one day he would enter into that land of which he spoke in John 8. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Or rather, it was Jesus' word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Are you looking for that day that Abraham was looking forward to? I hope you are. I trust that you are. If you're a child of God, you can say, I am one of those. I am a child of Abraham. And so you are. The one to inherit the fulfillment of the covenant and the promised land is the one who trusts in God and his promise, just as Abram did. Well, Romans 4 points out, is this a faith of work of your own or your own doing that you may boast? We read chapter 4 of Romans in the first reading of the scriptures tonight. What did we hear in those words? Absolutely not. It is a gift of God. Hear this, believer. God supplies the covenantal condition that we must keep. What is required by God is a covenantal condition. We must receive him by faith. But what is faith? Faith itself is something that God gives us. So God gives us the stipulation that we should keep so that we become a child of Abraham and receive, receive the ultimate promised land that is heaven and the new heavens and the new earth. How does Romans 4 end? Do you believe this, brothers and sisters? Do you believe Paul when he says... Now, it was not written for Abram's sake alone that it was imputed to him, but it was written also for us. 
It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised for our justification. Genesis 15, 6, the spiritual inheritance that Abram would believe, would receive, is not to be glossed over easily. It's not to be glossed over easily, but in it are rare jewels and beauties that are given to us, spiritual jewels about our justification by faith in Christ alone. And if I can say this side note, I pray that we are seeing how the Old Testament, as we go through Genesis, as we go through uh, Genesis, I pray that we will let Scripture interpret Scripture. Because when we do find that not all the promises are meant to be taken literally or physically, we see that in much of the Old Testament, there are physical types and shadows that point forth to the spiritual realities that are to come. If we are to understand our Bibles, we must understand this and let the New Testament teach us what the Old Testament was saying. Well, let's, let's look at the sanctions lastly, the sanctions of the covenant, verses 9 through 11 and 18. Now our next element is the are the sanctions. That is the curse if one does not keep the covenant. Along with the covenant blessings are covenant curses. We see those enumerated in the book of Deuteronomy as well as Leviticus. There are covenant curses. And as you look through the Old Testament, this image of the covenant curse is listed over and over and over. We see this graphically in verses 9 through 11. It's in these verses that we find a common ancient Near Eastern, Near Eastern, covenant economy. It was typical for animals to be torn apart and for the covenanting parties to walk between those parts. And the symbolism was that if one breaks the covenant, the same may be done to him as was done to the animal. So the covenant of curse, covenantal curse is shown here as walking through the parts of the animals. This brings out a very important element of covenant making in scripture because we often make covenant sound like a human contract. You sign a contract to make a car or make payments on your new car. You find fall behind in those payments. The, co the contract is broken and the car is repossessed. You're alive, you just don't have a car. But a covenant is far more serious if we break it. And we would do well in our culture and churches to bring back the seriousness of covenant making. In the Near East, they would cut a covenant. That's what was referred to when a covenant was made, a cutting of a covenant. In verse 18, we read, the Lord made a covenant. They aren't signing agreement. They're not signing a contract. They are cutting a covenant, quite literally, as animals are cut in half. Thus, Abram cuts these animals, which are typical of sacrifices under Moses' time later on. But here they are simply the animals of cutting the covenant. And then in Abram's vision, he sees the vultures coming down on the carcasses, and he chases them away. There are no empty motifs in Scripture. That is to say, everything was written for a specific reason. And what is the meaning of these birds? Now, the commentators differ, but they all circle around covenant breaking. And it is that these vultures are symbolic of covenant breaking. As I said before, if you read through the Old Testament, which I hope you've done this year, you will see when someone dies, a wicked king or something like that, a covenant breaker, what is the result? Vultures or animals gather around that person and they partake of the carcass. That's symbolic of God's covenant curse. And it was symbolic of God's covenant curse to Abraham if he broke this covenant or if his descendants broke this covenant. We see in this, and again in Jeremiah 34, where the, cuff, the calf is cut into and those who broke the covenant would be made food for the birds. 
Then we see this again in Revelation 19. Covenant keepers go to the marriage feast of the Lamb or covenant breakers will have their bodies made for supper for the birds of prey. We see that both in Jeremiah 34 and Revelation 19. And so while many break the covenant and in some cases try to exterminate it, Abram is seeking to uphold and keep the covenant to save Israel and to shoo away those vultures who will not preserve it. So overall, we find the sanction that is that if one does not keep the Abrahamic covenant, he will be torn apart like animals were torn apart in this vision. Well, finally, the oath. And yet as we come to the oath sworn, we find something interesting. We find that God alone passes through the Isle of the car Carcasses, taking upon himself the mal, the self maledictory oath, maledictory oath, solemnly swearing himself malediction if he does not keep this covenant. If he does not keep this covenant, he swears by himself, for there's nothing greater than he can swear by. He has kept this oath solely, solely upon himself for his people, and this is the part that I said R.C. Sproul. Rejoice, rejoices in. We see God is the guarantor of this covenant of grace, and it can never be broken. God can't be thwarted. It can never be changed. It can never be taken out of our hands, for God is sworn with this oath that he will redeem a people for his own glory and his own pleasure. So in verse 17, God appears as a smoking oven and a burning torch and establishes this covenant in a one-sided fashion. It's a one-sided covenant. God alone will see to it that the promises of the covenant are fulfilled. God will do that. But it's not fulfilled. <laughs> Praise God that it's not fulfilled by human effort, but it is fulfilled by God. Abraham will try with human effort, and we'll look at that in the future. He will try to have a child Ishmael with Hagar, but no, God will have it his way and give Abram a, Abram a son. Well, we are drawn then to our own hopeless ability to save ourselves by our own strength and our own works, and as Romans 4 says, it's futile to even try that. Spiritually speaking, we are spiritually barren just as Abraham and Sarah was. It is only by faith. Only in believing God and trusting in Christ that we can be covenant keepers. And as I said, God gives us the faith to do that. Our salvation depends not on our worthiness, but on the Lord alone who shed his own blood to save his people. Well, what about this curse? What about this curse? Was this curse taken? We see that it was. We see that it was, or the covenant has been broken. It's been broken by you and I, but we don't have to pay the penalty. We don't have to incur that curse. Jesus Christ took on that curse of the vultures coming over this sacrifice. Christ is the one who took the curse for us. Well, what about you? What about you? Are you walking by faith in Jesus Christ? Do you see his covenant as a true blessing to you and a true gift from God? It is my prayer that as we consider this covenant, your mind will be drawn to the greatness and magnanimous love of the Lord Jesus Christ and our triune God. We deserve that curse. We deserve those animals to tear us to pieces, to be torn to shreds for our sins. But God was gracious to enter into this covenant and keep it himself. God will supply the conditions, but blessed and praised be God that he gives us the gift in the stipulation. Let us pray. Father, we 
Thank you for that Jesus Christ is the one who took on the curse. Cursed is the one who hangs on a tree. Cursed is everyone who doesn't continue in keeping all that is in the law. That's the curse that we deserve, O oh God. That is the curse that we deserve. But Jesus Christ, our surety and substitute, was the one who stepped in and took that curse for us. And we are the blessed ones. We receive his righteousness, and he receives the guilt punishment for our sin no blessed double imputation father we are not worthy of it but we are grateful benefactors of your grace and this covenant bless us as we contemplate this more and more and as we rejoice in your goodness toward us and mercy in jesus name amen for more messages like the one you just heard visit Westminster Presbyterian online or in person at westminsterbartlesville.org or in person at the corner of Adams and Chickasaw in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. We meet every Lord's Day at 10.30 in the morning and 5 p.m. in the evening. We'd be glad to have you.